Hi, my name is Paul, and today I would like to show you how to derive the Doppler shift formula. Now, why am I doing this? Well, number one, someone's asked me to actually do it, so here you go. But secondly, I think it's really important for science students and physics students in particular to know that when we have these complex formulas, in this case the Doppler shift formula, they're not just plucked out of thin air and it's important to understand the principles at which they, they come about. And in this case, we're going to see that simple kinematics and our understanding of the wave equation allows us to derive the formula for the Doppler shift. Now, quick reminder of what the Doppler shift is, and it's basically the changing frequency due to the relative motion between a source and observer. Now, I'm gonna give you a quick demo, uh, and but obviously I've gone through greater explanations in some previous videos, which I encourage you to look, and I'll put the link up there, and also in the description below. So I'm hoping that you already are familiar with a little bit of the Doppler shift. Here's a quick review. I have a phone here, I have a little app here that allows me to play a particular frequency. In this case, my frequency is gonna be 700 Hertz, and it's gonna be picked up by my microphone underneath my chin. But what I'm gonna do now is move it rapidly towards me and away from me. Now, yes, there's gonna be slight changes in amplitude, but if you listen carefully, you will hear a change in frequency or pitch. Okay, so your frequency that you hear isn't necessarily the frequency of the source. It depends on the relative motion. In this case, the source is moving. Now let's quickly review what you already should know about the Doppler shift, and I encourage you to look at the video before we go ahead. But here is a summary. We have two situations where we have relative motion between the source and the observer, where they're moving towards each other, and we have relative motion where the source and the observer are moving away from each other. And you see that the formulas are very similar. We have our perceived frequency, which is our F dash, is equal to the actual frequency of the source. And then we've got this relationship here that involves three velocities, the velocity of the wave, the velocity of the observer, and the velocity of the source. And you can see that we're adding things up the top and subtracting. And when we look at the other side, where we have relative motion moving away from each other, we have a minus at the top and the plus are down the bottom. So how does this formula come about? So let's now break it down and discuss the derivation. So in our first example here, we're gonna see where we're only dealing with the velocity of the source being the one that's actually moving, the, the observer is stationary. And so I want to make sure we annotate here. So we have this distance across here, which is our wavelength of our wave between the two crests. But of course this is moving and it's moving a certain distance. Now what is that distance? Well distance is equal to simply the velocity multiplied by the time. And so our case that distance is going to be equal to the velocity of the source, I'll use a subscript s, multiplied by the time. And in this case because it's about the waves it's actually the same as the period. And so this distance here is actually the wavelength that's perceived by the observer. So let's put that together. What we get is our perceived wavelength that the observer picks up is equal to the original wavelength of our wave minus the distance. In this case, it's going to be the velocity of the source multiplied by t. Your understanding of wave equations is really important here. So you should know that the velocity of any wave is simply equal to f lambda, but it can also be written as lambda over t. But of course, we're interested in the frequency. So we want the perceived frequency. Well, that's equal to the velocity of the wave divided by my perceived lambda. And so now I can have is my velocity of the wave over lambda minus velocity of the source multiplied by t. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this section here and I'm going to pull out velocity of the wave over lambda. So I'm going to say this is equal to the velocity of the wave over lambda. Now what would I have left over here? Well, I'm going to have one on the numerator, that's fine. But if I'm going to pull the lambda out, I'm going to have one. And then minus, I'm going to have the velocity of the source multiplied by t over lambda. What I now have here is the frequency because velocity of the wave divided by lambda is simply the frequency. And then what I have over here is still one over one minus, but I'm gonna clean this up. But do you remember my relationship up over here? I still have the velocity of the source here, but I have t over lambda. Well, lambda over t, but what's that? That's the velocity. 
So now we've got the inverse of that, so I'm going to put velocity down the bottom. And so now I have this equation here. The frequency that is perceived is equal to the original frequency multiplied by 1 over 1 minus the velocity of the source over v. Now I want you to remember that particular formula because we're going to look at it very briefly shortly. So now let's have a look at the other situation. In this case, the velocity of the observer is the thing that's moving, that the person is moving towards a stationary source. And so in this case, the velocity that is actually experiencing here is actually a combination. So in other words, the velocity that the observer picks up is not just the velocity of the wave, but also the velocity that they themselves have. So the new velocity that is picked up is the velocity of the wave plus the velocity of the observer. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the period in this case. The period being the perceived period, well that's equal to the wavelength divided by the velocity, which in this case is our velocity of the wave plus the velocity of the observer. Again, we're not interested in the period, we're interested in the frequency. So what we're going to say is that the frequency that observed, well, the frequency is the inverse of the period, so I'm going to simply say the velocity of the wave plus the velocity of the observer over lambda. Again, like we did before, we're going to try to pull out the frequency term. And so the frequency term in this case is going to be again about the velocity of the wave. So we've got the velocity of the wave over lambda. So that is actually our frequency. We'll clean that up in a moment. But what do I have left on the outside? Well, again, I have one plus the velocity of the observer over the velocity of the wave over, well, nothing. That's going to be just one. So now if I clean that up, I get the frequency that is observed is equal to the original frequency multiplied by 1 plus the velocity of the observer over the velocity of the wave. So there is our formula where we're dealing with the source being stationary and the observer is the one that's moving. But remember, both can occur at the same time. And you remember what we had before. Well, we had the frequency that observed is equal to the original frequency multiplied by 1 over 1 minus the velocity of the source divided by the velocity of the wave. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to combine those two formulas together because both can occur. So I get the frequency that is observed is equal to the original frequency. Now the top becomes this numerator. So I have 1 plus the velocity of the observer over the velocity of the wave over 1 minus the velocity of the source over the velocity of the wave. Can you see where we're heading? If I now multiply both the top and the bottom by the velocity of the wave, just like that, what do I get? I get the frequency that is observed is equal to the frequency that we originally had, and then I get the velocity of the wave plus the velocity of the observer over the velocity of the wave minus the velocity of the source. So there is the formula that we had when the two objects were approaching. Now I'm not going to go through the second situation where the objects are moving away from each relatively speaking because it's actually the same process. What's different though is very simple. The difference is, is that the signs will be different. So I'm going to get a minus up the top and I'm going to get a plus down the bottom. Notice how I put this up. So when the formula is written down, we have plus minus up the top and minus plus down the bottom. So if the objects are moving towards each other, we're going to get an increase in frequency that's perceived. So we're going to have to have the plus at the top and the minus down the bottom. That will make the number bigger than one. If we had the objects moving away, that is the source and the observer are moving away from each other, relatively speaking, then we have a smaller number for the numerator. So we have the minus at the top and the plus down the bottom. So there you have it. There is the derivation using the wave equation and some simple kinematics to determine the Doppler shift formula. Now this of course applies to the motion of objects with sound. This is not the same as we have, for example, where we look at the Doppler shift in terms of light. Because the key thing here is, is that with light, the speed of light is constant for all observers, no matter what the observer or source is doing. And that means we're going to have to need a different formula. In any case, my name is Paul from High School Physics Explained. Please like, share and subscribe. Please follow my channel. 
ring the bell so that you get the latest updates. And if this has been helpful for you, put a comment down below. Take care. Bye for now.